I would like to welcome Dr. Greg Autry to the conference. Dr. Autry researches space, entrepreneurship, and technology innovation at the University of Southern California. He has served on the NASA Agency Review Team and as the White House Liaison. He currently serves as chair of the Safety Working Group on the Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee at the FAA and as VP for Space Development at the National Space Society. Please welcome Dr. Autry to the conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, I appreciate the opportunity to have a little conversation here uh, about the moon and uh, finance and investment. And with no further ado, I'll uh, leap into uh, sharing my slides here. All right, um, I wanna talk about what I call selling the moon or how do we convince uh, investors to, uh, to do something that's uh, at first glance, not very rational for a group of people who are generally looking for significant returns in the five to 10 year period and looking often to, uh, to minimize risk. Here we've got uh, just what investors usually don't want, which is really long uh, timeframes for return uh, and very significant risk combined. So the first thing I wanna uh, note is that, uh, that space is big, really big. So here's a number from uh, the Space Foundation. Uh, they're basically saying that the size of the space market in the last year they measured 2018 was $415 billion, which was significantly up from the previous year, which I believe was in the $450 billion. Uh, however, uh, we should note that global television uh, is a significant portion of that number. If we look at the space investment uh, quarterly from uh, Space Capital, the folks at Space Angels, um, they came up with a $5.8 billion and the good folks at Bryce came up with $5.7 billion of investment into the commercial space sector broadly uh, during the last year, 2019. I like to say that's close enough for private sector work, make all my friends at uh, NASA and DOD chuckle. However, Sometimes space isn't really that spacey. As I noted, uh, a big chunk of this was uh, DirecTV Dish Network and other space communications uh, that are grouped into this section of commercial space endeavors. And uh, in fact, uh, perhaps the ver very biggest portion of that is those services. And it isn't just the value add that those services, but the total, uh, total revenue is being generated by those services. Clearly a significant portion of that value comes from the content creation at the Hollywood studios and not from the fact that uh, you happen to be receiving it from space any more than if you happen to be watching uh, a streaming movie uh, on an airplane that you could credit the entire uh, revenue to the airlines as opposed or the value add to the airlines. Again, uh, if we go and we look in more detail at the uh, investment cycle, the space capital folks have recently changed their accounting so that whereas uh, last year they reported $25.7 billion invested into space, uh, they now have leaped to $109 billion. So uh, how did that happen, right? How did we make this huge leap? Well, the key thing to see is that they have begun accounting for what they call applications. And in each of the quarters of 2019, this applications market was by far the biggest segment of the market. And they did not account for that in, uh, in previous years, which allowed for this multiple times growth in, in the investment into space. Uh, what that really means is that uh, companies like Uber, Snapchat, uh, that are using uh, technologies uh, related to space, notably GPS, are counted in this investment criteria. And, uh, you know, Pokemon Go would be in there if somebody was investing in that. So we've got to be a little uh, both realistic about how much money is going into space, but also realize that there's an important lesson here. And we'll get to that. So I'd like to say uh, the story so far is that economics abhors the vacuum. Uh, it's not uh, an attractive place to invest. However, uh, incrementalism has paid off for companies. And this is a big lesson as we head to the moon when we look at what's happening at Leo. The companies that have succeeded in Leo, notably made in space and kind of the smaller end and on the space manufacturing side and, and SpaceX on the space transportation and soon to be communication side are companies that have very carefully identified incremental business that they could do that could actually produce revenues 
and profits to encourage investment as opposed to uh, the big quantum leaps. So companies that were going to do huge ambitious things that were going to pay off sometime in 2060, like asteroid mining, uh, are gone. Uh, they won't survive the market. If you can't deliver an actual revenue stream and eventually positive cash flows to your investors in their lifetimes and even a time frame they expect five to ten years you probably won't succeed and we've got to figure out how to do that on the moon it's also important that companies with earth side options things that delivered value to human beings on earth have also succeeded uh, relativity space founded by a couple of students i've been proud to work with uh, at USC for many years and been an advisor to their company after that um, doesn't just make rockets. They make the world's largest 3D printers. And one of the reasons they got $140 million from their investors is their investors are thinking in the back of their mind, if this rocket thing doesn't print out, there are all sorts of cool giant things that we can print uh, with the world's largest 3D printers and with the sophisticated software and AI tools that relativity has brought to bear on large format uh, 3D printing. That's something that has value, whether the space solution succeeds or not. If you look at the uh, stock chart over on the right for, uh, for space or Virgin Galactic stock, uh, that was a heck of a hockey stick curve at the end of last year and right up to the uh, uh, coronavirus disaster. And why did it do that? Uh, well, the number one, pitch that uh, George Whitesides and folks at Virgin were making to the investment community was that this isn't about space or space tourism. This is point to point travel. We're going to dominate the travel and to see the future, which will be ballistic suborbital flights hurling uh, uh, us all from one place to another across the earth in 45 minutes or an hour. Uh, taking down the traditional airline industry. And that, that's what drove a lot of investment in this, not just the uh, thrills for, uh, for wealthy space tourists. So incrementalism, Earthside investments are what you've got to have if you want to see space uh, succeed and the moon succeed. Branson, interestingly, uh, actually bailed out his airlines with funding from his space company. And that's a pretty amazing space to be. So one of the things that's not happening in, in the moon, which I think is really important to talk about, and this is also needs to start with Leo, is down mass. If we're gonna exploit lunar resources and energy and start manufacturing things in space out of lunar material, the biggest market for that will still be on Earth uh, in the short time frame. We know that in the long time frame, it's all about getting millions of people living and working off the planet, as Bezos likes to say, it's actually billions of people. But before we go there, uh, you're going to have to bring something interesting back to Earth. In order to do that, we're going to have to reduce the cost. When Made in Space makes Zeblan or some of the cool things that they might make in space or farm pharmaceutical companies might grow some wonderful uh, crystal or solve some problem uh, that might, uh, you know, cure blindness. Right now, we're kind of depending on free down mass. So all this stuff that's happening at ISS National Laboratory uh, is depending on Dragon Capsules bringing things down. And that, that isn't really free, and it's not high volume enough commercially. So one of the sectors of the market I don't see anybody talking about that's super critical if you're an investor or you're a, uh, a wannabe entrepreneur is look at the down mass market. We've got to find a way to get large amounts of things back to Earth simpler and cheaper. And uh, everybody's talking about launch. Everybody's looking at human space flight. There, there's very little attention paid to this large, cheap down mass. Getting stuff from the moon, that's harder than LEO because of the velocities and uh, the re-entries. Certainly more challenging, uh, but the fundamentals are very similar. So solve that problem. Another thing to think about is, are there opportunities to solve problems on Earth that start with the moon? And how do we implement those on the moon first. So a lot of folks have talked about creating solar power on the moon. Uh, this moon belt idea is one and beaming that power back to Earth. Nobody's going to fund that because that is way beyond the five to 10 year uh, funding range. Um, no government is going to step up with that amount of money or maintain it long enough. Uh, it's a pipe dream unless we find a way to find an incremental approach. And the solution, I think, is to turn that upside down. And what do I mean by that? 
Well, instead of beaming power from the moon to the earth, let's beam power from space. And you could use the lunar orbital gateway as a perfect initial platform to do this for robotic missions on the surfaces to the lunar surface. So you've got 16 day lunar night problem. Uh, if you happen to park uh, the gateway over at L2 or L1, depending on uh, which part of the moon is in darkness at the time, you can beam power to surface operations. And eventually you could have dedicated uh, satellites for those purposes uh, that could uh, be in a halo orbit, avoiding the, uh, the lunar shadow and uh, beaming your power down to operations, either human uh, operations on the surface or, or robotic operations without having to worry about uh, the lunar night problem. And if you solve that space solar problem for a real need that government and commercial operators will have in the next 10 years on the moon, then you can bring that back to, to how do we do this, this bigger, more complex uh, scaling problem of beaming power uh, from the moon to the earth. Uh, but this is something that somebody could do and probably get funding from NASA and other locations for. Uh, the U.S. government gets it, which is a, a really good story. Uh, so there's been a series of space policy directives and a brilliant executive order out of the White House uh, that clearly indicate that the U.S. government is going to establish a set of regulations and the rule of law in the lunar environment that are going to be productive for U.S. companies, and they intend to work closely with the international community, primarily in bilateral agreements, uh, to make an accessible uh, regulatory environment uh, uh, available on the moon. The Artemis Accords from NASA uh, just had Mike Gold speaking to my International Space University Florida Tech class a couple of days ago about this, are clearly focused again on these bilateral approaches working under the uh, general umbrella of the Outer Space Treaty to establish the details on how commercial actors and government actors will work together interactively in a lunar environment uh, for productivity. This is a really good thing for the investment community. The one thing the investment community doesn't want to invest in is the Wild West and leaving the Outer Space Treaty with its good but ambiguous language in regards to uh, uh, operational zones and uh, non-interference. Uh, would be a little bit messy when it came to letting commercial actors loose on the surface. Nobody knows what their actual rights are and who is it that's, uh, that's going to, to defend or implement those, uh, those rights. Another great thing is that the Department of Commerce gets it. Uh, when's the last time you saw a, a Secretary of Commerce come speak to uh, uh, the, the Space Symposium? Well, uh, Wilbur Ross did that. Uh, the, the guy really gets it. He's been pushing for funding for the Office of Space Commerce within the Department of Commerce, as have I and others. This is really important. Unfortunately, the latest congressional uh, language rejects additional funding for the Office of Space Commerce. Here we have an industry that is $400 billion now. The Bank of America projects will be over $2.7 trillion, basically the size of the UK economy or twice the size of the Russian economy. And the Office of Space Commerce has a couple million dollars in their budget, and Congress won't give them any more money. If the Congress of the United States expects the United States to be competitive in the 21st century, or if they care about the future of all humankind, they need to pony up a few million dollars, which they'll never notice in their budget, to do the right thing by the Office of Space Commerce so we can get a leg up on this competitive environment so we can address things like space traffic management before they're a disaster. Uh, it is a real shame that that has not been done. Uh, other parts of the U.S. government get it, the DOD, uh, particularly when you look at organizations like uh, SCO and uh, DIU have been doing uh, amazing things. Um, there was just an award to, uh, to Leo Labs, uh, which is really kind of a, uh, a COVID-related uh, uh, investment there to, to help them uh, survive the crisis. Uh, the XM Bank totally understands the situation. This was an organization that has just been re-empowered uh, and reinstituted to help the U.S. make its company succeed in the developing world by matching the kind of aggressive uh, subsidies and funding situation that our competitors have been uh, putting out all across Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and Asia, and they've got a distinct focus on space. 
the FAA gets it. I'm happy to be part of the Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee there. Uh, the DOT hosted us in the, in the DOT headquarters, brought in Jim Bridenstine, brought in Ted Cruz, brought in uh, several other speakers. Uh, and this year, of course, we were online. Uh, we had Scott Pace talk. The point is, the FAA understands that there's a future in commercial space. Uh, they're doing the regulation for launch and, and reentry, and they're doing it in a way that uh, leads the world, which is why launch companies like Rocket Lab and companies like Virgin Galactic that are actually founded by foreign nationals and backed by a lot of foreign capital come to the U.S. Uh, with their headquarters and licensing because they want to be licensed uh, under this regime. The UK gets it. They're increasingly investing. And just a couple of weeks ago, they went and bailed out OneWeb, uh, who was a victim of a couple of different things going on, uh, including, uh, finally, I think, uh, as a last straw, the, the COVID uh, economic crisis hitting investors in March. The Japanese government's putting a billion dollars into commercial space. A lot of this, like that little rover you see down there, should be going to the moon. The Chinese government gets it, and it's hard to tell how much they're spending and subsidizing commercial space, but one of the most telling signs is this, that if you look in these three different categories of investment from space capital, China is a, a big, big number two in applications and distribution, but a minimal investor in infrastructure. Why is that? Well, because the Chinese government is giving their space companies the infrastructure, meaning that the rockets you see being launched by X space and others are three-stage solid rocket boosters built in a Chinese ICBM factory and launched out of a Chinese uh, military-run space installation. Um, and, and that's all free, which is why China doesn't need private investment into the infrastructure side nearly as much. I've been talking to people uh, in the field about what's going on about space investment. And uh, I talked to Matt Colo from Techstars, and he indicated that, you know, COVID's obviously impacted the market, and he expects uh, an industry downturn with short to medium impact, but he believes the long-term market will return to health. Uh, that is super important for Lunar. Uh, access to lab space in testing facilities has been really difficult because of the COVID coronavirus problem. We've got to find a way to solve this. We've got to find a way to get our engineering students, in particular, back into the labs. All my business students will be online next fall, and they'll survive that. But people working hands-on with materials and hardware need to be able to do it. Uh, from what I've seen at the seed stage, capital is still there and rounds are coming together, but timelines are definitely stretching out and, quote, urgency levels aren't matched. Talking to Jordan Noon at Relativity Space, um, they were excited to complete their Series B, uh, but they're in time for the, uh, uh, the investment crisis to occur. But they're now seeing an uptick in investment in real hardware and real infrastructure. There's a lot less investment in, uh, in fluffy, indistinct uh, projects that, uh, that are hard to quantify. Uh, but real hardware that's going in space, going to the lunar surface, is getting investment. Uh, Mir Blackman from Axiom Space, the folks that uh, just got a contract to attach a tourist module to the International Space Station, uh, also report they're doing well. They got $20 million in their seed in uh, Series A, and Amir tells me that they'll have a $100 million plus Series B announced shortly. So with that, I'd like to take questions, particularly about uh, how this all translates to uh, to lunar investment. If you want to track me down uh, in the real world, you can find me here. Uh, I'm at Greg at gregautry.us. Um, also on social media at Greg W. Autry. Be sure to get the W. The, the gentleman without the W uh, isn't me. All right. Questions, folks. Hey, Greg, I've got a question for you. Yes, Mr. Stanley. So um, I'm just curious what your thoughts are on uh, with with the potential uh, Donald Trump loss with the election this year. Um, how you think that might affect uh, the government getting it, and and if you think that there's hope for things maintaining a positive trajectory, even if that does happen. Right. Well, I like to look at space as a bipartisan environment, first of all. But regardless of how you feel about Mr. Trump in any other category, he has been the space president. Uh, he has gotten it. He's stepped up and made bold commitments to both uh, exploration and science missions. He's stepped up and, uh, and backed 
the traditional companies and the commercial companies. Um, he has put out the money and encouraged Congress and succeeded uh, until this most recent uh, congressional bill in getting strong bipartisan support uh, for these projects. And uh, even with the, uh, the somewhat disappointing result of uh, the current congressional appropriation, what we're seeing is uh, a situation where we're still far ahead of where we were from the George H.W. Bush administration until the, uh, the first Trump budget, NASA was stuck at 18 to $19 billion. Uh, when Mr. Bush left office in 1992, that was 1% of the government spending going to NASA. Uh, when I came in with the agency review team to make recommendations to the Trump administration, that was 0.42%. It had been cut by more than half, uh, primarily uh, by simply not adjusting it for inflation. So the president's done that. Uh, the space policy directives and the work that Scott Pace has done at National Space Council, which the president stood back up. Uh, again, that was dissolved by the uh, Clinton administration in 93 uh, and never reinstated, uh, brings together um, all of the departments and cabinet positions that work with space, again, Commerce, DOT, uh, DOD, to work together in a cohesive environment. Uh, they have helped put together space policy directives that have been universally and bipartisan uh, praised. So that's all good. Uh, should the president uh, not win re-election? I hope people have seen how good that stuff was and they stick with it, just like this administration stuck with good work that the Obama team did, uh, particularly in regards to commercial space. And when we saw uh, President Trump and Vice President Pence out there for the, uh, uh, the Demo 2 flight, uh, the final uh, victory of the commercial crew program, um, you know, that happened because of good work that was done during the, the Obama administration and that president sticking with the COTS program that the Bush administration had launched. So there's been continuity in that regard, particularly in commercial. I hope we see it there. Um, I would be concerned though that we wouldn't have nearly the strong level of advocacy for, uh, for space broadly and for spending on space that we've seen in the last four years. Does that answer your question, Ben? Yeah, thanks. The only other thing that I might follow up with is knowing that you were on that transition team uh, with NASA. I'm just curious if uh, if you have anything else that you could say about uh, how those teams are put together and and what that might look like for for a potential administration change. Yeah, I mean, every administration puts together a team of experts to go to NASA and, and every other agency. I happen to think that uh, the NASA transition team was the the strongest team in the, uh, the whole uh, uh, transition uh, environment. Our agency review team had a great group of professionals uh, and they were bipartisan and they were both from traditional and commercial space. Um, and, you know, there was some wrangling, but we agreed on going back to the moon. Uh, we certainly agreed on uh, asking for more money to achieve our goals and trying to stop this, uh, this fighting between the different priorities in space, right? Which are generally nonpartisan. They're more about where is your congressional district, right? And, you know, we were kind of done with that. We didn't want to fight traditional versus uh, commercial startups. We didn't want to fight uh, science versus exploration. We, we wanted a little more top line and it was justified because of the many, many years of cuts that NASA had taken by never having its, uh, its budget adjusted. Um, you know, if you're a, a progressive Democrat, it's your job to go out there and, and convince uh, convince your representatives that, uh, that they wanna care about space, that humans kind's long-term future is as is, is important as our immediate needs and that the, uh, the focus that they may tend to fall into of problems right here on earth uh, is laudable, but it, it doesn't let us solve the, the, the bigger problems. Um, I like to say that no large problem was ever solved from inside the box. So if you care about climate and you care about long-term uh, social issues, uh, keeping everybody cooped up in a resource limited uh, environment is not likely to result in, uh, in, in long-term peace and happiness. We, we've got to get out beyond that. So, uh, you know, that's my message to, uh, uh, to folks on the left and uh, uh, folks on the right, uh, stay the course. And uh, in any case, whoever is elected president, let's all stick together and, uh, and go to the moon. Next question. Anyone got a question out there? All right, uh, I've got a quick one for you. Yes, sir. 
So I'm, I'm interested in uh, space resource extraction and prospecting. Uh, you, you mentioned some of those incremental steps. What, what are some incremental steps that you would suggest in building a business model for that type of a, a industry? Yeah, um, so if you said to me, we're going to start a lunar mining company, and I've got this long-term vision and, and you know, you're gonna send us some resource prospecting probes and maybe uh, a satellite before that with uh, ground penetrating radar um, and then some landers and then you're gonna identify where the best mining location is and then you're gonna build a $100 billion uh, lunar processing center and then you're gonna put up a rail gun to to launch that stuff into space where a space factory is gonna uh, convert it into to some usable uh, commodities. Um, no, I'm, I'm not investing in that. Uh, that's way too expensive. Uh, it makes the Manhattan Project look small probably, and there's no payoff in the reasonable time. So what do we do on earth if they can get us there? Uh, so, you know, I would focus on how do we automate mining technology here on Earth in ways that enables exactly what it is that we want to do in space? So certainly a constellation of LEO satellites with ground penetrating radar looking for resources on Earth and helping us optimize that technologies to help us optimize mining on Earth so it's less environmentally destructive uh, and less labor intensive and less dangerous uh, so we don't see a, a group of uh, 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 miners in South America, you know, trapped underground again uh, while the whole world waits in, in horror. Um, we, we could solve a lot of those problems and develop the technology you now need uh, to get to the moon. Uh, and if your company reinvests those profits into its bigger vision the way SpaceX does, right? If Elon had come and said, I'm looking for money to set up a city on Mars, never gonna happen. But if he said, I've got the opportunity to win this COTS contract at NASA, uh, and you know we need funds to build the Falcon 9, which is gonna have all these other commercial customers when we're done, and then we're gonna do Starlink and generate revenues, and all that money goes back into my, uh, my Starship project, uh, that works, okay? Investors can understand that. So look for the resource extraction opportunities here on Earth. Uh, and how you can make those better and then channel those funds back into, uh, into your lunar dreams. The other thing I'd say is there are small lunar mining projects on the moon that could return money. If you could do a sample return mission from the moon essentially and bring back some moon rocks and cut them into to teeny little five carat stones and sell them uh, as lunar engagement rings, they would outprice diamonds by far. And I've done some analysis on that with a couple of uh, small startups, and I think that that would be a actual commercially viable business. NASA could help make it work uh, by agreeing to accept some of that material uh, as well uh, with some grant money to ensure that it happened. It would also be important because it would actually be the first case of taking legitimate lunar material attracted uh, in an entirely commercial manner and exchanging it economically on Earth uh, to prove the U.S. position uh, and set a pre legal precedent of you can do that. Michael, you got a question? I saw you pop up. Um, yeah, so uh, taking a bent toward politics, but also dealing with a little bit with, with the economic aspect, aspects, we had a speaker yesterday um, suggesting that there was a very high likelihood that um, the government would begin applying or that it courts would begin applying um, the NEPA process to space. Um, and um, the suggestion was within the next year or two, um, expect to have to do an EIS process if you plan on going to the moon or going into space and pretty much doing anything. Um, is there any possibility of getting a federal moratorium on applying NEPA to space? to be able to prevent that from happening yeah. until we get operational experience. Yeah, now I think it's really important. There are some people who I believe are entirely misguided uh, about their understanding of the scale of impact that commercial space or government space operations are going to have on a body like the moon. Mm. Uh, they're not gonna notice this for a very long time. And a moratorium would make sense, establishing some specific guidelines uh, 
understanding that there are areas of unique scientific interest and cultural heritage sites is something that is already built into the Artemis Accords and NASA is already working on. So beyond that, I don't think we need that regulation. There are no reasons to believe there's any biological organisms. There are no cultures to impact on the moon using analogies to the tragedies that occurred in the 15th or 16th century on Earth is, is not relevant. Uh, we need to go ahead and exploit these resources for the benefit of our environment and for the benefit of all humankind. So we don't want to see that. Congress should pass a moratorium uh, other than those areas of unique scientific interest and, and cultural significance, uh, you know, the lunar landing sites, for instance. And I believe, honestly, at least this administration would probably do everything they could to block enforcement of anything that, uh, uh, that uncalled for uh, and make sure that the protection was done, but done in a way that made... Uh, made sense and unique to that environment. Filing economic impact studies uh, uh, makes absolutely no sense. Uh, and the agencies that do that have no credibility or, uh, or experience uh, in, in, uh, in, in space uh, environment. So I see no reason for that. David, did you have a question? Yeah, hey, uh, Greg. Uh, was, we were talking about uh, what the path might be if Trump is not reelected during the, uh, the session on, on uh, space policy a little while ago. Huh? I was wondering, uh, you, you recall uh, probably that we had in the evolvable lunar architecture the concept of having a number of small robotic scouting prospecting missions and it fairly well in advance of the first uh, human return missions. Yes. So I was wondering if you thought trying to maybe refocus uh, or, or proceeding with the next president on uh, getting them to do more extensive robotic scouting. And uh, that might be something that would be seen as enough of a change from what the current plan is, but not, uh, not too disruptive, perhaps. Well, again, uh, I'm personally hoping from a space perspective that there's not a change. But should there be a change, uh, <laughs> A, I think that we want to convince the new team to consider as much continuity as possible. The last thing that NASA needs is a major disruption. If they don't agree with the 2024 date, for instance, uh, and they need to put their own stamp on the program by, you know, naming it after somebody else or, uh, you know, adding some different objectives, uh, all of that might make sense. But I would hate to see the human exploration program derailed yet again. Uh, I think that could be a risk to NASA's human exploration entirely if we, if we don't. Uh, if we don't stay this course. We've seen too many uh, good initiatives uh, uh, taken down uh, for, for political reasons in the past, and we just can't let that happen. That said, yes, uh, robotic exploration, I think, might be more appealing uh, uh, to some folks uh, in the Democratic side, and we should certainly encourage it. We're already doing it, obviously. The CLIPS program uh, is, is an amazing step forward uh, of public-private partnership in uh, robotic exploration of the lunar service. And certainly we could do more uh, from the NASA side as well, but let's, let's not step back from the human exploration program and, and start over or wait for something magical to happen. We, we've got to stay the course. Yeah, no, I, I agree completely with that. Just thinking, you know, if we want to get more private investment and getting back to the, you know, being able to get the financing to do mining, the yeah. one, one Viper mission is not going to be sufficient. We really need to have a number of them. And, okay. uh, at the cost of a Viper mission, we could probably be doing a number of smaller missions, with, uh, smaller or uh, less Agreed. costly. I don't want us to always think smaller and how to reduce the budget. The NASA budget's too small. Now, if it was actually adjusted uh, all the way to where it should be, it should be $40 billion, okay? If we took the George H.W. Bush 1992 budget and adjusted it for the growth of government, it would be $40 billion today. And right now we're arguing between 22 and 25. All right, and to put that into perspective, the cost overrun on the F-35 uh, project, just the overrun, not, not the planes, is $180 billion, okay? It's six times bigger than the whole friggin' NASA budget. And that's just the overrun. The fraud, waste, and abuse part of Medicare, the part that the GAO identifies as is being completely wasted uh, is four times bigger than the entire NASA budget every year. So you know we, we can afford. Yeah. Uh, to yeah. Do both. Well, maybe yeah, maybe maybe I should rephrase that. But take take the budget that we've got for something like Viper and 
trying yeah. to figure out how to get you know a, a dozen I of them, not just one. Be careful about taking somebody else's project and disassembling it because you want to spend it better, right? And I understand you know there's people want to take the SLS and turn it into this. They want to take the James Webb Space Telescope and turn it into that because it's a big pot of money. Let's get rid of ISS because it costs three billion dollars a year. Yeah. That's not the yeah. thing. We all need to work together in space uh, to get the budget that, frankly, our future and our children deserve. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Well, well how about let's let's take the uh, take the Viper and figure out how to replicate it with small companies doing a, a lot of them instead of yeah, no, I, I'm good know, with, just the one. I'm okay. Good. Yeah. I just don't want to go to war on anybody's program if if we can yeah. take ideas and to turn them into public partnerships that are cheaper. Uh, that's great. Yeah. Anyway, it just seems like that might be if there does have to be some sort of, of readjustment to uh, what we're doing. You know, that could uh, that could help to have that focus. Yeah. Well, I'll cross that bridge when we come to it. For right now, I'm just hopefully. But, yeah. Uh, hopefully, we don't we have don't to. Have but that. anyway. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, David. Greg, got a question. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, so imagine a scenario in which. Um, Democratic president is elected uh, and a blue ribbon panel is appointed. They take a look at the Artemis program under its current level of funding that Congress is allowed and they find that uh, we can't get there on, on this budget. Therefore, they declare it to be uh, unsustainable uh, and rather figure that instead of spending so much money on human space, space flight, we should spend it on climate change and Earth observation. How realistic do you think that uh, scenario is? There are definitely already people advocating for that. And, and if uh, we're here for the Lunar Development Conference, we all need to stand up and, and oppose that, regardless of what our other politics are. Uh, um, I don't, that's the way for mankind. Is there something that we could do now to, in anticipation that that might be a risk? I think we need to continue to get the message out there that if you want to solve the environmental problems, uh, just analyzing how bad it is, is not a solution. I wrote an article on foreign policy last August, and I just did a talk on Steve Kerwood's excellent show, uh, uh, Living on Earth, which is a public radio uh, environmental show. Um, we've got to have bigger, bigger environmental vision. Uh, the fact of the matter is, green power doesn't work on the earth. Uh, in reality, uh, is a sustainable solution because nighttime is a thing, and it, it, the night is uh, full of darkness and not full of batteries. Um, there's not enough uh, storage capacity uh, at all to get us through that. If we want to actually cut emissions to zero, you've got to do space development, space solar power, uh, and other solutions out there. And if you really care about the earth, you've got to get the extractive industries off the planet and eventually the heavy manufacturing as well. And some chunk of the population, Bezos totally gets that. Uh, we've got to convince, uh, the environmental folks that everything is not short term, that the, the bigger term problems can be addressed concurrently. And again, the NASA budget is so, so small as a part of the, the total federal budget that, that adding a few extra dollars to do what they want to do with uh, Earth observation satellites should not impact uh, the exploration program. But realistically, do you think we can convince environmentalists before like this January or February? Get out there and try unless you want to not have any lunar development conferences anymore. That's all I can say. Yeah, thanks. All right, uh, our time I believe is up. Uh, you can all reach me at greg at gregautry.us and uh, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all. Thank you so much.